Same-sex marriage is being legalized in a growing number of jurisdictions, and a growing number of lesbian and gay couples are having children. Today on Family Matters, we take a realistic look at same-sex parenting. Separation and divorce are difficult. You have rights. We fight for them. Why do people hire family lawyers? The most important reason is to protect their children. I'm John Schumann, the head of the family law group at Devery Smith Frank. Clients also want to protect themselves, protect their finances, and plan for their future. Contact me at 416 416- 446-5847 or at www.devrylaw.ca We will protect and guide you. At the Watson Gopal Family Law Group, our focus is to work with our clients to keep costs, conflict, and emotional stress low while trying to achieve favorable legal results. Our lawyers are skilled in traditional family law litigation, but we pride ourselves on promoting innovative out-of-court options such as mediation, arbitration, collaborative law, and parenting coordination. Your family law issues are unique, and our approach reflects that. Watson Gopel, contact us today. Whatever your views may be about same-sex marriage, the reality is that more and more same-sex couples are becoming parents whether or not they get married. How do same-sex couples become parents? Do these couples and their children face challenges that don't exist for other families? That's what we'll be discussing today. We'll meet a lawyer parenting two children in a same-sex relationship. But first, let's meet Dr. Anthony Hutchinson, who is a social worker and professor who teaches sociology of marriage and the family. Dr. Hutchinson, welcome to the show. Thank you, Justice Brownstone. Do you agree with me that same-sex couples are becoming parents at a rate much higher than ever before. Well, what we see in terms of tracking and monitoring in Canada, where the statistics are quite uh, rigorous across the nation, uh, there is a propensity for same-sex couples to be recognized as couples and to marry increasing percentages based on our census data. Uh, Similar data in the United States is more difficult to track because uh, in many states uh, they don't have laws that acknowledge same-sex couples and their rights as people to cohabit. And so they don't keep track of these couples. But we know they're there. Absolutely. And they mm-hmm. seem to be having children far more frequently than uh, when I was a, a, a young adult. Well, it's, it's, it's a matter of the measurement. Uh, when we pay closer attention to facts, social facts in society, then uh, it, it would appear that numbers begin to increase. What we do know is that um, same-sex couples in, in Canada, for example, are about 0.8% of our population. Um, so there's roughly about 75,000 uh, um, same-sex couples across Canada um, out of the millions of families that we have, and we know that roughly about 10% of those same-sex uh, couples um, generally have children. Um, sometimes those children were pre-existing from previous relationships, right. but what we also know is that women uh, tend to be five times more likely to have children in the relationship, in the same-sex relationship, compared to, let's say, a gay men. But we know that same-sex relationships are roughly split, uh, about maybe 60-40 in favor of men. Uh, Can you Canada. just take us through very briefly what are the reproductive technologies that exist out there for same-sex couples to have children? What, what we understand is that uh, things like adoption, assisted fertility um, in, in the form of donor insemination tend to be technologies that are accessible 
to uh, both same-sex couples as well as uh, heterosexual or traditional couples as they're coined. But one of the things that there still is is a stigma around same-sex couples accessing such technologies. In 1997, the legal case in Alberta of Mrs. T, for example, who successfully um, parented uh, 17 foster children, um, the minute that uh, her lifestyle was deemed to be a same-sex lifestyle from its previous heterosexual lifestyle, right. she was ruled to be an unfit mother when she wanted to adopt. And so there, and that same stigma and double standard still seems to be pervasive despite uh, the legality of same-sex marriage across Canada from G July 2005 and then, in, then even in some of the American states where it is, is legal in the United States. Now, what does the research say about children who are raised by a lesbian couple or, or, or gay men? Right. Uh, how do these children turn out? Is there a higher likelihood that the children will be gay? Well, I think what we have to understand is that it really is about people. Um, you know, using labels such as same sex versus straight um, it does have implications for identity, but people are people. And what the evidence shows is if a child is being raised in a loving, accepting, caring family by a loving, caring, accepting uh, individual parent, that's what's most important. Um, for example, when we look at child welfare agency data across Canada, uh, the majority majority of, of cases of dysfunctional children and children gone awry are coming from straight parents. Um, there's very few uh, child safety or investigation matters uh, that where the parents were, were deemed to ever have been uh, gay or, or same-sex couples. So what we understand is that it's really about the relationship between the parent and the child. And that's what we need to be looking at. How loving, how, how caring, how accepting is that child? And, and when we look at the data around self-esteem, functionality of the child in terms of uh, performance in school, um, functionality at home, uh, um, in terms of how the children feel, the child feels loved and accepted, all of the data shows it does not matter whether or not the child was raised by a same-sex couple or a straight couple, all that matters is does the child feel loved, safe and accepted. But I think you're talking about how emotionally healthy that child will be, how uh, uh, ach high achieving the child will be, how uh, able to function in society. But what about the sexual orientation? I think mm -hmm. a lot of people still think that if, if a child is raised by two women or two men, that child has a higher likelihood of turning out gay mm -hmm. than if that child were raised by a heterosexual couple. There, there, there's very, very good um, social scientific evidence that's very balanced in terms of methodology and what it basically demonstrates is that it, 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 there's no greater likelihood of a child becoming, let's say, gay if they have same sex or straight parents. Um, you know, um, homosexuality is, is not uh, passed on genetically. There's absolutely no evidence to indicate that. What, what the evidence does overwhelmingly show is that gay children are typically born from straight parents. That's true for every gay person I know. They were raised by straight people, not gay people. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, more with Dr. Anthony Hutchinson. Stay with us. Justice Brownstone's wardrobe is provided by DG Bremner & Company, a luxury sportswear retailer for men. Visit dgbremner.com. Separation and divorce are difficult. You have rights. We fight for them. Hello, I'm Michael James O'Connor. Family law requires sensitivity, flexibility, and confidentiality. The lawyers at McConn and Beyond O'Connor and Peterson are trained to use all avenues available, including alternative dispute resolution, mediation, and litigation. Our family lawyers are equipped to handle your needs in a sensitive and positive way. We can help. Please call.
Welcome back to our discussion of same-sex parenting with our guest, Dr. Anthony Hutchinson. Dr. Hutchinson, you teach a course in college about the uh, sociology of relationships, correct? Yeah, the sociology of marriage and the family. Yes. And you cover th the same-sex relationships in your course. Yeah, we, we address same-sex parenting as, as well as all different modalities of family life. Now, you don't self-identify as a gay man. What interests you in this topic? What interests me are people. And I think that all people have a right to self-determination, to be who they are. And most importantly, every human being has a capacity and a need and a propensity to love and to care for other human beings. And that's what I'm interested in exploring. What is the love, uh, acceptance and caring dynamics that we as human beings share with each other and with our children? What about the, the mentality out there that says that it's simply not healthy for children to be raised by gay parents? They will be stigmatized at school. There's such cruelty going on. There's bullying. Uh, that, that these kids will not have a balanced upbringing because of the cruelty of others. Not that the parents are bad, mm -hmm. but others will stigmatize them. What, what we see is that bullying occurs for a plethora of reasons. And if, if, if it's not going to be because of who a, parent's, uh, a child's parents are, it's going to be for another reason. For example, if a child has a parent who's a police officer, maybe that child will be bullied and harassed because their parent's a police officer. If their, their parent is a newcomer to Canada or a newcomer to the United States as an immigrant, they could be equally uh, bullied. So what we see is that we can't scapegoat any um, P any person in, a, in and across our society uh, for a reason to bully children or to um, look at you know what their sexual orientation is. But one of the what the research shows about same-sex parenting in particular is the fact that there's no greater propensity of a a child who's raised um, by a same-sex parent versus a straight parent to you know be any less happy or any less dysfunctional or have a self-esteem issue. What's most critical and vital for any child, regardless of who the parent is, is, does, is that child loved, cared, raised in a safe environment, and, 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 and being treated with, with everything that a child needs to be um, healthy uh, within their life. So it seems to me then that children who are raised in same-sex uh, relationships have some challenges though, because I would think, for example, if I were raised by two women, yes. when Father's Day comes along, um, that's got to be a difficult day for me as a child, wouldn't it? Well, you know what I mean. If yeah, I, if, if if my father was an anonymous donor, yes. Uh, at what point and in what way do I find out as a child? Yes. Uh, how I came to being. Well, That's not the same thing but as what a child would would go through if there's a mom and dad in the house. Many uh, of the phenomenon that shape us as a society are socially constructed. And this is what the vital point is. And if we, if we have a true society that's, that's premised on ish, um, uh, you know, things of education and knowledge awareness, and, and, and then, then we can get away from some of the stigmatization that comes from the, the kind of victim blaming um, social uh, beliefs that we have across our, our society. And that's what's important because what what happens is we do maybe have children who feel left out or but it's not because they're any different or but it's because of what society teaches so it's very very important for us to give messages of love acceptance um, and uh, to our children and and many people talk about tolerance I'm a proponent of acceptance at, versus tolerance right. and 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 that and that's and that's something to be equally applied to let's say the children of same-sex parents as to newcomers to Canada there's absolutely no difference and, and I that's would say one you of the things we have to focus on there are lots of kids who don't have fathers and Father's Day is difficult for them for other reasons. Absolutely. And when we look at lone parent families, they don't have fathers and, and, or, and mothers. Or, or, or mothers in some cases. So, so we have to be very, very cautious how we're applying labels and how we're, we're, we're feeling our children uh, in terms of making them feel isolated or, or, or marginalized. We need the, the mandate is broader than just saying, is it a same sex parent or a straight parent? It's really about, is it a loved parent? cared for child in a safe environment. Do you know if there are any studies that deal with the, uh, these grown-up kids mm -hmm. who have no identifiable father because their father was, was an anonymous donor? Mm -hmm. uh, is there any research that shows how they cope with that? Because it's natural human curiosity to mm -hmm. want to know who your parents were. Right. I mean, children that were adopted, mm -hmm. 
very often look for their birth parents. Yeah, I mean, I've do, I do a lot of work in fatherlessness, especially with marginalized young men who get involved in gang activity. And and uh, but what and, and there's definitely a need for let's say having positive role models. But that's the key: positive role models. It's not whether it's a male or a female role model. It's whether it's a positive one, and if the experience for the child is loving, caring, and functional. Because you know, it, just to say it's about fatherlessness or not knowing who the parent is, that could be counterintuitive because what if it's a dysfunctional parent or what if it's a violent or abusive parent? Well, that would be worse. It, but, that's right. But isn't it true that a young boy needs a male role model in their life? may not be a, a parent, mm -hmm. could be a grandparent or an uncle, and that a young girl would need a female role model in her life and that and but what the evidence shows is the role model need not be a parent the role model uh, may only need to be a, a, a functional healthy person in my life uh, as a, a gang involved young person the person who was one of two men who was absolutely critical in my life in, in, in shaping me to be the person who I was was a gay atheist teacher a gay atheist teacher yes right and uh, along with a Christian youth work, male youth worker. And I was so, hoping it would be a judge. Well, I did have a good experience with a judge later in life. But, oh, but, 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 but my, my point is, it wasn't about whether the person had a faith orientation or whether they didn't uh, believe in a, a God. Or it, even whether they were family. Or even whether they were family. They were both male, they both came from different spectrums, but they both showed me concern, genu genuineness, and authenticity and obviously cared about you a lot. Thank you very much for being on the show, Dr. Hutchinson. Thank you. When we come back, we will go in chambers with lawyer Kelly Jordan. Stay with us. People often ask the family lawyers at Debbie Smith Frank if we can protect their rights without going to court. We know how to get people the results they want through mediation, arbitration, or collaborative law, often without the stress and hostility. Our full-service firm will protect you, your children, and your finances, in or out of court. Contact us at 416-446-5847 or online at www.devrylaw.ca. Hello, I'm Michael James O'Connor. Family law requires sensitivity, flexibility, and confidentiality. The lawyers at McConnell and Beyond O'Connor and Peterson are trained to use all avenues available, including alternative dispute resolution, mediation, and litigation. Our family lawyers are equipped to handle your needs in a sensitive and positive way. We can help. Please call. Welcome back. We're in chambers with my next guest, Kelly Jordan, who is a lawyer and also in a 20-year same-sex relationship. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Thank you for having me. I understand you have twins. I do. How old are they? They're nine. Well, I appreciate you taking time away from them to be on the show with us today. Tell me, I've been dying to ask this, how realistic is that movie? You know the movie The Kids Are All Right <laughs> with Julianne Moore and Annette Bening? How realistic is that a depiction of a female same-sex couple? Well, I mean, I think parts of it are realistic. I mean, they ha they're struggling with stress, work, juggling children. That's, that's the same as any family. But the affair, the running off with the sperm donor, not so realistic. I don't know any female couples that have run off with any men, even if they're not Mark Ruffalo. No, no. So it didn't seem realistic to me either. And it kind of bothered me that people out there might be watching that and thinking that that's actually an option. Right. When uh, it's not. Yeah, I mean, I'm a divorce lawyer, and I can tell you that that, that kind of scenario is not something that's crossed through my boardroom. And I, if it was existing, I think you'd know about it. Tell me, if um, a child has been conceived through an anonymous donor, uh, what's the best way to explain to children how they came to be conceived in this world? Well, you know, it's funny, people always ask that, and, and it's not so much different than how you explain to any children their background or how they came to be, the birds and the bees, you know, there are, there are children that live with single parents, grandparents, same-sex parents, um, heterosexual parents. It, it just really, it, it really depends on the child and their age and stage of development. But usually, even in a uh, single-parent household, with a for a child and a father that's absent, 
Right. The parent will say something like, well, your daddy's gone away. Your daddy doesn't live with me anymore. He's, he's moved on or he died or something happened to him. Uh, in this case, there isn't a recognizable father, an identifiable one. Right. So I think it is different. Well, I mean, I think that what, what parents do in these situations is talk a bit about how, you know, the, the, the child was very much wanted and loved and planned. I mean, that's very important. Yes. And that, you know, we needed some assistance in order to have a child on our own. And so we went to a doctor or we went, you know, to, to a clinic and, and a man helped us um, have you. And we're so glad that you're ours. And is there an age when it's appropriate to make that, give that kind of explanation to a child? I think it depends. I mean, you wait for the child to question, and then, then you engage appropriately. I don't think it's something that you necessarily have to share from the beginning. And kids just naturally are curious about their origins and, and will ask about it. So what happens at Father's Day at your house? Well, usually we're at my father's house. So they spend a lot of time with their, with their uncles and, and uh, their grandfathers. You know, I think that's an important point you've just made, because some people say, well, if you're raised in a household with a same-sex couple, you're not getting the other sex presence in the child's life. You know, there's no father figure if it's only two women. And it's as if they don't realize there's a whole family out there. Well, that's right. I mean, there are lots of male role models for, for children everywhere, whether they're with a single uh, mother or whether they're with uh, a lesbian couple. What do you think of these lawsuits that are brought by adult children who were conceived by uh, artificial insemination with an anonymous donor and they're suing to find out the identity of their biological fathers? Yeah. Well, the, the, those are very difficult cases. I mean, first I'd say that not all what we'd call donor offspring have the same desire to meet their, um, their biological father. Do for we instance. even know what, what percentage of kids want to know? We don't know. There's been very little literature out there that has studied that. We know that adopted children are more interested in it than perhaps donor offspring. In and finding a, their biological parents. Right. But there's, there's a real range. I mean, the difference is, is that donor offspring are planned, loved, wanted from their families from the beginning. Right. And so it's a different experience than adopted children who might be curious about why their uh, biological parents couldn't keep them and care for them. So it, it is different. Um, but what's tricky about these cases is they're trying to undo things that were done already. These, these men who had graciously donated um, you know, and they did understood. so on the condition of anonymity. Yeah, that's my point, that I wonder whether these, uh, these adult children understand that they wouldn't be here if it hadn't been a confidential arrangement that the donor had and believed. And yet, um, I can see from a rights perspective that they might have curiosity, like any person would, to know who the person is and to find out if they have siblings. Right. Well, many of the sperm banks now actually offer identity disclosure, which is something that the child could access at the age of 18, which is what happened in that movie. Exactly. Is that common now, do you think? It's quite common. Do you think that um, it's something that the donors would want? Well, I mean, the law is uncertain right now in most jurisdictions about what a donor's obligations are. Certainly a donor doesn't want to be held financially responsible for a child that was a result of his donation. I can imagine not, because they probably have children of their own that they're raising, and they haven't factored in that there's these other children out there. And yeah, maybe they're curious too. Yeah, they, they might be. I wonder also about um, a, an issue that is often raised by people who don't know same-sex couples, and that is, are the children of same-sex parents stigmatized at school? Is there a risk? Is there a higher risk to them of being bullied uh, because they have two moms or two dads? And you know kids can be cruel. Right. Well, I mean, I'm lucky because I live in a large urban center where there are many same-sex families. In both of my son's classes, there are other same-sex parents. So I, I, I haven't encountered that. It's fortunate. That's very fortunate. But I can imagine that in some places, uh, a child might be the only one in the class, or maybe even in the school, where the, uh, the, uh, they, they are the only one that have two same-sex parents. Um, how do you protect a child from, from being singled out and, and made fun of or, or, or embarrassed in some way? 
Well, I mean, that's why it's so important that you're talking about this issue on your show and that people are out there, and that's really why I'm here today is to make sure that people know that we're families and we're, we're just like any other family, struggling with finances and kids and work, and, uh, you know, we just want our kids to be respected and loved. And that's true for everybody, gay or straight. It is. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thanks for having me. When it's hard to meet or even talk together, put the power of computer software and trained negotiators to work for you. Lawyers, mediators, and families can harness smart settle software to produce high value agreements for separation, estate, and elder care. Smart settle software can help parties reach an agreement worth 10 to 20 percent more value for everyone. Get connected. Get smart. Get settled. Learn more right now at smartsettlefamily.com. It can be difficult to talk with family about estate planning at the best of times. Many families don't talk enough about the issues they face, such as remarriage or the family business. Hi, I'm Jim Doyle. I help navigate the complexities of today's modern family when it comes to integrating your investment and legacy planning needs. Wouldn't it be nice to see your professional advisors speaking to you with a common voice? When protecting your legacy is important, ask how Jim Doyle and Investors Group can help. Hi, I'm Lauren McLean. Today on q and our question is, I'm separating. What can I do to protect myself? Hiring a good family lawyer coupled with proper divorce planning will reduce your costs and help promote a successful outcome. Review your family financial records and all mail coming into your house so you know what the family assets, debts, income, and expenses are. Copy all key documents and store them outside of the home. Finding loan applications is often golden when it comes to proving real income and asset values. Don't sign any blank financial documents or credit applications and ensure that you block any ability for your spouse to increase debt or credit. Have your mail sent to an address other than the matrimonial home and be sure to change the passwords on your computer and phone. Don't panic and quit work if you're employed. And most importantly, don't move out of the family residence without getting legal advice first. Thanks for watching. For extended interviews and exclusive content, please visit our website at familymatterstv.com. If you'd like to submit your legal question to our Q&A, go to advicescene.com. I'm Justice Harvey Brownstone. See you next time.